Yeah, this is a live demo uh, running in OpenFin, so all bets are off. Okay, so I want to talk about interoperability, which is kind of the theme for FinJS uh, tonight, besides Snowmageddon. Um, and what interoperability means for us at OpenFin. So the capital markets are powered by thousands, thousands of desktop apps for trading, market data, news, research, and collaboration, right? And all of these things create this ecosystem that looks like this is a microcosm. And please, if you don't see your name up here of your organization, please don't be upset. Um, but what's interesting to me about this is that we have, okay, we've got sell side and buy side, and a lot of times these things are um, kind of mixed together. Um, but we have, um, you know, single dealer platforms going from the sell side to the buy side. Both sides have internal apps that they, that they develop. You know, a lot of these banks, they, as many, all of you know, have thousands and thousands of developers. They're huge developer organizations, technology companies in their own rights. Down here we have vendors, and there's just zillions of these vendors, right? Because I'm not even including any of the fintechs here, really. So they're kind of some of the big heavy hitters. Obviously, Bloomberg and Thomson Reuters are big kind of anchors within that area on the desktop. And these provide trading platforms, market data, OMS, EMS, and collaboration, and uh, probably a lot of other things I'm not naming, all into this ecosystem, right? So what you end up with is this huge, uh, you know, system existing on the end user's desktop within the capital markets. Um, so how do we get these things to work together effectively? Now, cloud services have traditionally been the way that we do this, at least on the web, right? So you have APIs and you have OAuth and things like that that allow you to, um, you know, create that kind of innovation, and that's worked pretty well. But really, the service layer is kind of like just half of the story, right? Because there's this like huge, huge long tail of apps existing in these systems, and and I experienced a lot of this in my previous manifestation at Thomson Reuters where I uh, developed the Icon App Studio, right? And, and we saw that there was just all of this capital in terms of intellectual property invested into apps that existed really on the front end screen. And all you really wanted to do was to bridge those things together. And to do that was like cheap and easy and quick to do. Um, and it created a lot of scenarios that couldn't exist otherwise. So, you know, it's really important to me uh, that what happens in the client is a lot more than just UX sugar, which is the way I think a lot of people think about it. It's like, oh, it's a client, it's just CSS and fluffy, nice, pretty things, right? But, like, okay, so this is, I don't know if there's database people here, this is like the, you know, kind of one of the most critical thing ever in database. This is, a map created by Dr. John Snow, I'm not making that up, in London, 1854, during the cholera epidemic. And what this guy did is that he um, mapped out all the places where there have been instances of cholera. And he noticed, oh, look, see these? These are wells. And he was able to trace that, to take a data set, and by putting it on a map, be able to tell what the source of the cholera epidemic was, and they could do something about it. This was the start of epidemiology. It was really the start of data visualization. So fast forward many uh, years, and you have uh, Google Maps, right? This is the first kind of like, I think, real mashup kind of driving widget that you have. Like in the, I'm gonna date myself, I, um, so in like the mid 2000s, which is like mid career for me, um, you, you had uh, Google Maps like come out as, as a widget and all of a sudden you had like hundreds and hundreds of Google Map mashup apps, right? And this was like really exciting because you could take a data set and you could put a map on it and, and it looked great and you had this kind of interactivity. It was all on the client, right? And, and the thing is like you can't really like, you know, like if, if you create like a map API that people called and they had to wire everything together on the front end, nobody would have used this thing or very, very few people have used it. 
But instead, you got things like this, which mashed up um, Craigslist uh, real estate listings. It's called Housing Maps, I think. Uh, it doesn't exist anymore, of course. Um, it, with, with onto Google Maps, you can actually see where the apartments being listed were, right? And this was like amazing. This was like really cool. The point is that we, you know, by having this stuff available on the client, you could create these integration points that before nobody had really thought about or imagined. Um, so, a um, little shout out to Joseph Cornell. Um, the, uh, you know, the, previously, so like we, the way that we've done these kinds of integrations and interoperability is to frame things into some sort of container that handles all the framing, right? It's like, you're basically saying, okay, come into my big tent and, um, you know, I'll provide you interoperability, but you're gonna be an app in my world, right? But, hey, what if apps could interoperate as peers? So these are three videos showing interoperability between OpenFin and uh, Bloomberg, Bloomberg and Thomson Reuters Icon, right? So these are OpenFin apps running in, in the JavaScript web world, talking to desktop applications and finance, right? So in this case, we're remote controlling Bloomberg through the, um, I always get this wrong, Terminal Connect, thank you. The Terminal Connect API that is part of the app portal for Bloomberg and we're able to basically call the Bloomberg terminal and there's a lot of feedback, sorry, call the Bloomberg terminal and um, basically just uh, do remote control calls to it. Very similar down here is the Icon side-by-side -side API. We're doing the same thing. We're able to say, hey Icon, give me a chart on IBM or whatever, give me some news give me a quote on Apple, give me some other news, and, and we can just, an icon will just launch those things. And over here, this video kind of just went dead on me, but we have, um, this is the Bloomberg DAPI API, right? We're actually getting data feeds from Bloomberg. Again, this is an OpenFin app, and it's talking to Bloomberg, which isn't even on screen here, and consuming data from the terminal and it's all happening through a JavaScript API that uh, OpenFin's interoperability layer has enabled, right? The, the main point of this is that we've just made it easy. I mean, you could build all this stuff yourself, but we're interested in how do we make this stuff easy? How do you make it so that the cost of doing this is as close to zero as possible? Because we think by making it easy and cheap to do these kinds of integrations, we're gonna unlock huge amounts of innovation across the entire ecosystem. So let's look at the way some of these things like look like in really crappy demos built by me um, and using also some stuff from some of our partners um, to, uh, to, to make that happen, right? So, um, so let's say that I want to, oh, all my resizing is killed. So I want to um, display uh, news, and this is an app from FinTech Studios here um, for IBM, right? So I've got, this is an open Fin app on this side here, um, and this is another app that's uh, from FinTech Studios. Uh, they don't know anything about each other. They, they're strangers, they've never met. Um, all they know is some protocol to talk to each other over, right? So. Then it's not necessarily a protocol specific to them, it's just a protocol, right? So I'm gonna hit go and, oh, I see what I did. No, I know what I did wrong. Yeah. Excuse me. So I, because I didn't get the uh, screen outage problems, I'm getting the other problems, right? Okay. So problems of my own making. Um, so this is, right, we just loaded IBM. So let's, let's do something else so you won't, you'll actually believe me, like let's try Apple, right? So we're basically doing a little handshaking and saying, okay, give me, um, give me uh, news for Apple. That's cool, right? That's kind of boring. Okay, so like what if we wanna have a chart from Chart IQ? Um, not using Finsemble yet, but I'm waiting for that beta, I'm very excited. Um, and look, oh my God, like Chart IQ's already got Apple right there, right? So we're able just to pass that context along. Again, these apps don't know anything about each other, right? 
And like, let's say I wanted to build a really bad uh, quote app using Quandle, or some, I think that's what it's called. Um, right here, this is, yeah, my incredible coding skills, that's why I'm CTO. Um, so, uh, you know, it's just right there, right? So now we got three independent apps and three windows. They're like totally, they don't have to know anything about each other. They just know that I was instantiated and somebody passed me the symbol and I can do something with it. Um, and that's, like, that's to us what, you know, the heart of the interoperability thing is being able to have apps that can work as peers. So like, let's look at some, a couple other scenarios. I know we're short on time. And um, so let's say, you know, it's a very common scenario. I want to create a launcher, right? And like, so I want to be able to serve an entire workflow to my end users. And I want to be able to set that up a priori so that like, you know, I can just say, um, here, this is your workflow as a researcher, trader, investment manager, whatever it is that you're doing, and we're just gonna serve it to you centrally. So I can just key these off of a particular, um, you know, uh, symbol, and boom. I get all those three apps I showed you before. They're all like kind of, you know, linked together. They're all running off of the same symbol. I can, you know, I can say, okay, well, you know, I also wanna see Microsoft and, you know, I can do that and, you know, I can position these however I want. If I had, like, multiple monitors, I could push them around the screen, anything like that. So that's, that's like, a really cool workflow. It's, it's a very common workflow, but the idea that you can predefine workspaces and serve them out to people, I think, is really exciting. And, it, and it's a really cool thing. It's something that people do in the financial space all the time, but being able to untether that from having to run that in any specific container, I think is really exciting. Um, so let's say you wanted to have just like a, a service that pushed stuff to you, um, you know, and those totally hidden, right? That you didn't even see. So let's look at what that might look like, and then they're gonna they're gonna get a big hook out and pull me off. Um, nice, you know what I did? Yeah. So. So I have um, a service that's gonna look for news on currencies, it sees this, it pushes a notification to me. There was no app running that did that. The app that was running was totally hidden from me. I can, now let's say I wanted to now, that app's just gonna send an event, or the notification's gonna send an event that is not gonna work, and I will try it one more time. It's gonna send an event that's gonna say, hey, I want to trade on this thing, right? Boom, and now this is a, a trading app from Adaptive, also running an open fin. I can just launch that. So the idea is that there was an intent to say trade and that this could be fulfilled in the workflow, right? So again, this is um, just kind of putting together various apps and you know, spit and polish for us, but the idea here that I wanted to just to drive home for people maybe was that is that interoperability really has a huge amount of value that is going that really impacts the long tail. And we have this huge long tail of apps within our industry, right? And that the the thing that's maybe holding us back the most is is a lack of standards of for interoperability around these things. Um, so, and if we can have those standards, we can have ad hoc workflows that address niche problems at a very low cost. So I, I, this is the last slide, I, I really promise. Um, so if we, um, this is basically crib from the spec for web intents from the W3C. So uh, I, I think that this spec is great at a general level. I think that you need to have industry level kind of information about it. But the idea is that you, in order to make this really work, and this is, this by the way, this is all like how your phones work, right? Like you, you, you wanna share a photo, you, you, you know, you tap on your photo and it gives you, it's gonna show you all the social media apps that you can share with. That's, this is the same spec, right? So you need to be able to register, you need to be able to invoke, which means basically call APIs. You need to be able to have a selection mechanism that allows you to, to direct things through your workflow of choice. You need to be able to have a mechanism for then the delivery and response between a service and an app provider, right? And, and all those things are, are about creating, you know, unlocking this level of innovation across the industry is what 
we are really super passionate about, and I certainly am. And with that, I'm going to say thank you, and uh, we're going to move on. Thank you.